Surviving storms. Surviving storms. Surviving storms. histories, my early research was on fatherhood in Dominica, I realized that in every story it was marked by a memory of Hurricane David. Time was positioned in relation to before or after the event of Hurricane David. We realized that actually Dominicans brought themselves back up to some sense of normalcy, mainly on their own, mainly by their own wits, by their own sense of determination, their sense of hope, their own spirituality, whatever it might have been that they drew upon. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, what if there was a place where all of these stories were held, where later generations could go and they could learn from the words and the stories of earlier generations. So we're hoping to try and create something similar to that, that has stories, but also that has other kinds of data on a map that people can access online, from their phone or from a laptop or, or tablet, and to bring up that kind of information. It will eventually exist at survivingstorms.com. This website is already live, but the map isn't there yet, so that's a coming soon. That's something to be looking forward to as we begin to populate it. But we're going to go now into the presentation, and we're going to be taken through the various different areas of work that we're going to be working in, and hopefully they'll speak to your interest. And then there'll be space afterwards, after each of the project team has given a little bit of a hint of what we're going to be working on, there'll be space after for you all to give your impressions, your reflections, and also your advice in terms of things we might look at, and also how you might be able to support the project in terms of involvement in some way. My name is Cecilia Green and I am an Associate Professor of Sociology at Syracuse University in upstate New York in the United States. So the work package which is um, Caribbean Women Farmers Participatory Oral History Project. What we are hoping to accomplish in, in this section is the creation of an archive containing the recorded life histories of a small number of female farmers in Dominica pertaining to their experiences and achievements, um, I would say over the last 10 to 30 years on a number of fronts, all ultimately connected to the struggle to adapt to climate change um, and, and, and catastrophic disaster events as well as um, you know, other big economic changes um, that have occurred in the in the global economy, we will ask them to share the adaptive strategies to these unprecedented economic and climate shocks uh, within their practices of farming, but also um, you know more generally within their practices of, of citizenship, both at the local community and the national levels. As well is um, everybody have that mapping, mapping, so we could be aware of the, um, the various communities where um, hot spots are the people that are places that are prone to hurricane. Good morning, everyone. You can remember my name, I'm Kela Angist, <laughs> and I'm doing the archive internship at the Documentation Center. So I started by looking at documents on the national. Um, Doc Center's website catalog and something um, after that I tried to move on to find narratives because that's what I was trying to do. They gave me a lot of free reign to do whatever I wanted so that's also what I decided to do. I decided to look for stories that from people who experienced it. I decided to take a chance and I requested to view the dispatch notes from the governor of Dominica back when Dominica was a colony and to my surprise that is where all my most uh, vibrant stories came from, it was from the governor who was there during the hurricane, experienced the hurricane, receiving reports from all over the island, different perspectives. You get all of this richness in just a few dispatch notes. I really did not realize that that, was, that, that would happen, so it was, pleasant, it was a pleasant, pleasant surprise for me. Even yesterday, I did my internship yesterday, I went and I looked at the dispatch notes from 1834, and when I opened the package, I just, I just looked at it and I was like, wow. The handwriting of the Lieutenant Governor of Dominica in 1834, requesting supplies of lumber, 
and barrels and flour <laughs> because of this terrible hurricane that had happened. That they come that the person who made the list of hurricanes compared to David. And uh, it was a very sorry, it is a very surreal experience for me. Every time I go into the archive and access these documents, every single time they would have this fresh perspective of, you know, getting back on their feet, getting back together, getting it back together. And I think that's what the, the wealth, the, the, <laughs> the soul of the Surviving Storms um, project is about, you know? That, that um, energy that they always had to rebuild, even though how bad the storm was. That's my favorite part about the archive internship is after I read that terrible story, especially of that one in 1916, which was almost as gruesome as Maria with the death toll and the, and the destruction and all of that. And I just love to see how they, how they plan to get back on their feet. Thank you. The um, internship is gonna produce a digitized um, archive itself, so an online version of all of these different key documents that she's focused in on so that people will be able to access them through the website and also that will be donated to the, the library so that on the library website, people will be able to access that as well. So that it's not that every generation would necessarily have to do the same work as Kayla Ann. This is what we'd hope, that every generation would have to do the same work as Kayla Ann, but at least that could be a resource, hopefully, that stays on the library website that anyone can access if they just if they just know where to go and click it. I'm just gonna give a very quick whistle-stop overview of what we're gonna be working on. Marika's coming in not only as shape president, but also as a fantastic photographer who's gonna be documenting some of these structures. But why tikais? Why these small, modest houses? Um, why do we think that we'd be thinking about surviving storms and thinking about these small, supposedly ramshackle wooden shacks? Thank you. I'm glad we're all on the same page. I asked that as a challenging question because I wanted to get that response and I'm glad that I did. Can we do next slide, please? These incredible historic buildings, which are so distinctive to Dominica yet so often overlooked as we move towards building in concrete and building much larger structures, while we don't want to romanticize them because for many people growing up with a large family in a small one or two bedroom divided house might not have been the easiest upbringing, what we do know about these structures is we know that they're incredibly well designed with the elements in mind. And I'm borrowing that from Lennox Honeychurch, who's written extensively about these small structures. This picture was taken from the early 20th century, around a similar kind of time to when Kayla Ann was describing that 1916 hurricane. My money would be on, I don't have any proof, but my money, if I was a betting man, my money would suggest that this building was able to withstand that storm. The reason being that we've got various different design features, from the, the half-hip roof, as some people call it, or the hip gable roof, which enables the wind to move up and over rather than lift up the structure. The shingles, which minimize the weathering of the structure itself. Inside the structures, the joins within the structure, the dowel joints, actually fuse, as many of us know, and you guys are probably more expert than me if you have any experience with these structures, they actually fuse over time. And the weathering means that you've got one single structure. Whereas on the other hand, when you've got a nail or you've got uh, even, a, even a bolt that actually weakens over time because it rusts and it corrodes. So interestingly, they work with the elements. Also, people knew incredibly well the landscapes, the way that winds move and travel through the landscape, so they knew how to position and orientate their structures. But also, as well as that, the, the, the hurricane shutters that can be, that can be closed down, the, the um, preps on the side of the structure as well that often will hold it up, the raised up um, foundations as well that minimize exposure to, to flood it, flooding and, and, and weathering from below, as well as the eastward kind of orientation to enable the winds to, or the breeze to come through and cool the structure. So these are structures that are positioned with their environment in a certain kind of way. Essentially what we want to do is create the first ever survey of Dominica's vernacular structures. We know that at an alarming rate these buildings are being destroyed. Many people moving on in their lives and they want to live in larger, larger buildings. So the idea is an island-wide survey moving across multiple different villages. And the idea is we're going to create a book. We've just got some funding, some external funding we've secured to get a book to produce with Dominican-based publisher Papillot Press um, to produce a book which will enable up-and-coming architecture students, maybe some friends of, of these guys from the college, for instance, who don't necessarily receive training in 
any of the traditional architecture of the Caribbean. And so to get some training, to, get, to have a textbook that they can draw, draw on, it's going to be a popular, popular book, but it'll also hopefully be useful to them, that they can draw on to get some knowledge of these traditional structures. Hopefully, we, we think, will give them a sense of passion for the vernacular and for the distinctive styles of buildings that we have here in Dominica. Many years ago, my grandmother actually wanted to renovate her house in Roseau, and um, it was the home of the late Jean Reese. But at the same time, like the question is, how, I guess, can institutions assist in preserving while at the same time transforming it to be resilient? Thank you for joining us for this launch event. My name is Dr. Shaila Esprit. I am here to introduce to you book package number three, the Dominica Story Project, narrating Post Maria survivals, recoveries, and futures. For those of you who don't know, Great Caribbean is the research institute based at Dominica State College. Um, I founded Great Caribbean in 2014, and it is an educational nonprofit that is devoted to um, academic excellence, tech empowerment, and civic engagement for young people of the Caribbean. So the students have already collected some of this audiovisual content, and the goal in phase two of the project will be to produce a small number of these into larger um, ethnographic projects, including documentaries, written projects in terms of blogs, other types of visual content. So the students will share their work and um, we will eventually be able to reflect on um, some of the questions here in relation to the other um, work packages. So Mia's gonna just offer some reflections on her experiences of doing some initial field work in Lubia. As you can see here, she is um, undertaking an interview. So just to share some of her reflections. More recently, we ventured out into the community of Lubia where we met and held recorded conversations with some of the individuals there who had been affected by both Tropical Storm Erica and also by Hurricane Maria. In addition, conducting the interviews that they evoked within me bittersweet feelings. I felt some form of sadness because of the heart-touching stories and memories that lived within the hearts of the people. But I also felt hope and joy from being able to converse with them and listen to them share their stories and their experiences with me, seeing them express the positivity that they extracted from the situation also brought me joy. While conducting the interviews with the people of Lubia, something I found to be very intriguing is that although all the stories were connected, no two stories were the same. Everyone was impacted differently, whether it was emotionally or physically. Next, we're going to move over to our, my colleague, Gabrielle Abraham. Um, so she's working for Mona GIS Institute based at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, um, but is originally from Dominica and now has returned back home to do field work. Um, so she's now going to speak a little bit about the GIS mapping work. This is all about thinking about the future and how we can identify using maps and uh, visual data, drone imagery and so on, identify different kinds of hazards within the landscape. So phase one, which was in Jamaica, I was in Jamaica from last year, August until February. During this phase, we did a lot of field work training, drone training, and then we also started developing the GIS database that we want to build, as well as we started off doing the base maps for the project as well. Through these base maps, one of the most key things that we did was use the scientific model, an exposure vulnerability hazards, or an EVH model, to build a vulnerability map for Dominica. So the worst ones being Roseau, Lubia, just a little bit lower, Marigot, Maho and Masak, and some area, other areas along the coast. So based off of the hotspot map, we already had some general areas that we knew that we wanted to cover when I come down, came down to Dominica. So for the city of Roseau, the areas that are red are the areas that would be the most vulnerable, particular, and the biggest problem we have with Roseau, the most major hazard would have been flooding from both the sea as well as from the river, which is what we saw actually happen during Hurricane Maria. So these are the things that I would then like to map 
and bring onto a map a, um, a resilience map so we have an understanding of okay this is what happened during hurricane maria this is how the landscape was before what is the landscape like now what are the things that we're doing now this project it really deepens the understanding of the patterns that contributed to I guess disaster that happened in the past. So people would know how to be prepared and appreciation, so being stewards of the land. Want to utilize the, 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 the suits, the springs, so we can take that knowledge and even incorporate it into urban development. This presentation is on bringing most to harvest and it's aimed particularly at the rural women farmers in the northeast of Dominica and it's part of work package six of this Caribbean cycle cartography project. It was sort of like a, mis uh, a misconception that um, we've got an unlimited water supply and this project is aimed at looking at that a little bit more closely and seeing how we can utilize rainwater for agriculture. And there is an increasing demand already being placed on our limited water supply. We can see that as our climate changes, uh, this is going to become really problematic for agriculture in the, in the future. And currently, there is already serious gaps between the available supply of water and the demand for water on island. So for example, Dominica is experiencing extreme reduction in stream flows. Um, I think most people would have noticed how many of the rivers have already dried up and the demand for water on island already exceeds the ability to supply during the dry season. So rainwater harvesting basically offers an inexpensive approach to using our existing water sources, but in a more efficient and effective way. And it's simply a low cost technique that requires minimum expertise, it requires minimum knowledge, but it offers tremendous benefits. And you can collect water using simple techniques such as you know, a pond, a bucket, jar, pots, etc. And rainwater can be used for multiple purposes, ranging from irrigation of crops to washing, cooking, drinking. And collective rainwater can also supplement your normal water sources. Uh, farmers can modify their agriculture structure and generate income since it enables farmers and various farmers to store water when it is plentiful, but it also makes the water available when, uh, you know, normal water supply is scarce. The long run is provide a buffer to the climate variations that the Caribbean is facing. We're also going to be using ferrocene technology, which is sort of like a, a pretty inexpensive method for constructing water tanks. And this will allow farmers to have a safe and sustainable method for water storage on, on their property as well. Today we had our opening symposium and we invited various different groups from village councils to members of the Office of Disaster Management and people from Creed. Various different agencies came together as well as different partners who are working on the project itself to talk a little bit about our project priorities, what we've done so far. We've been on island for five months, what we've accomplished so far in that small time, but also to help guide our vision as to where we want to go. Um, and today I think the session went well. We got some really, really useful and rich feedback from the different participants. Um, it's something I'm passionate about, surviving storms, because I worked for Maria. I did a lot of work after Maria in terms of showcasing what happened after Hurricane Maria and also Tropical Storm Erica. So today was a very interesting session. Like the nature, the interactive nature of the session, as I mentioned earlier, how the um, project is looking at taking historical information from the past, um, present information, and using that to develop um, um, data for planning, moving forward, um, food security, things sometimes we take for granted, you know, from our past culture that have made us resilient by nature. The lecture today, was uh, very interesting. I'm actually part of the TKI project. I'll be photographing there, um, the different TKIs around Dominica. So we haven't started, well, me personally, I haven't started that section, but I'm very, very excited for it because um, just to hear the stories of the people who live there and also um, looking at the vernacular architecture. I'm really, I feel blessed by the project team that we have as well who represented both remotely from Jamaica as well as 
um, from the United States, um, in Delaware and Syracuse, as well as presenting locally here in Dominica, um, as well as the interns we've been working with up at the Dominica State College who have been doing some incredible work and gave first-hand reflection on their experiences of doing interviews and gathering people's um, survival stories and so on. And yeah, just feeling, just feeling incredibly proud, incredibly grateful for the, for the opportunity to, to be doing this work um, and feeling happy that we've connected with the right people to be doing this work as well.